Liam is going to come around the room with a roving mic because the meeting is on the record and we'll, re we'll be recording the discussion. I ask that um, you raise your hand and let us know if you want to ask a question. If you have the mic, that you tell us who you are and your affiliation if you have one. And in the spirit of not excluding people in remote areas, I'm going to start at this end of the room first then give people over there a chance to ask some questions and then come back to the centre of the room. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Anybody over here who wants to ask any questions? There we go. We'll take two or three questions at a time and then come back to the panel. Hello, Anne. My name's Darren Adams from Concern Worldwide. I just want to ask a question about the categorical policy and the policy policy. I mean, it's sometimes given that social protection the only response to vulnerability. Of course, it's not. And so if we, have, if we look at poverty in terms of different debts and pe some people with labour, some people with assets, and some people without both, wouldn't you actually have different responses to those various types of poverty? So social protection wouldn't be the only response. So I suppose my question is, um, a 10% targeting might make sense for the group of people without labour, whereas other groups of vulnerable people with labour, maybe agriculture is the answer. Thank you. Anyone else over here? Hi, my name is Claire Shelton from Thierry. I just had a question about one of the omitted issues in terms of accountability to beneficiaries. And in your experience, what sort of community monitoring has there been of social protection problems or what can we learn from these programs? Okay, thank you. If we come back to the panel, Liam, can we go to the opposite end of the room next? Thanks. Frank? Um, categorical targeting and different responses for different poor. Well, in fact, the, 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 the so-called 10% targeting principle arises from an examination of the demographic structure of, of poor households in which it turns out that if you exclude households that do have able-bodied um, um, adult labour in them, uh, you, end up with, uh, you end up with around 10% of households that don't have such labour and, 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 and are very often composed of elderly people with dependent orphans or children and so on. Um, the problem there is that that assumes that the prob that, that, that the income generation problem is, is solely down to whether you have labor or don't have labor, and, and, and therefore it's just purely a supply of labor problem. Of course, there are millions of poor countries that have the labor, but no way of putting that labor effectively into income generation. Perhaps they're landless. Perhaps the economy is shrunk, and there are very few options outside agriculture that they could go to all kinds of reasons why even if you had labor in the household, that might not prove to be a very useful criteria for determining the, the serious degree of, of vulnerability that the household faces. Um, I know that only partially <laughs> answers that question, but it's quite a large question. Um, on the accountability to beneficiaries question, if I'm allowed to move to that, the hunger safety net program in Kenya actually is being put in place with very, very strongly with the ability for ben beneficiaries to influence the way the, the on the ground the program design is actually uh, undertaken in the end. And, and the whole program has a, it's got about five main components. One whole component of the program is to do with en enabling beneficiaries to participate in the process of, the, of, of program implementation themselves in one form or another, including grievance and redress procedures as well as, as ways of trying to make the program more responsive to their needs in terms of ease of obtaining the transfers and so on. So it's not entirely that's not entirely absent. It is being thought about, and in more recent programs, is, a, is an important uh, component. I think most of the programs we looked at um, <clears throat> didn't have anything in the way of grievance procedures in, in those six countries. Um, 
but the HSMP is, is one of the few that does have it built into the program design. Uh, we were working with Malawi government, uh, so was Rachel, on their design of the social protection policy. And uh, <coughs> we suggested this was put in, and it was quite sensitive. Government uh, didn't actually like that very much, but uh, yeah, it got in in the end. <coughs> I just wanted to say that, in fact, it relates to the duration of programs, because if you're implementing a short-term program, there's, there's two constraints to really looking at accountability. One is you don't really necessarily have the opportunity to get to know the participants. It's not perhaps cost-effective to invest in having a relationship with participants if they're only going to be on the program for a couple of months. That would make the kind of social um, facilitation components of a program very expensive. But the other thing is, if it's a short-term program, you don't actually have the chance to incorporate any kind of feedback into program design also. So it might not be a very useful process. So actually, it's linked to the, to the nature <coughs> of the programs. If you have a short-term social protection intervention, it's quite difficult to meaningfully include issues of, of voice in that. Um, one, one issue is, if something is legislated, if it's actually somebody's right to receive a particular benefit, then it's perhaps easier to mobilize and to get to call for accountability, to give voice to people. For example, in India, the National um, Rural Employment Guarantee Program, which has, has been recently launched, that's legislated. People have a right to access that particular social protection benefit, and so they can mobilize around the right. So that actually starts to make it easier to look at accountability issues. But in most of the kind of programs that you have in sub-Saharan Africa, it's actually difficult to promote those kind of issues. Okay, thank you. Claire, um, in Ethiopia, there's been quite a lot of work on grievance procedures in the Productive Safety Net program that we can tell you about later, if that's useful. Okay, down to this end of the room next. Two gentlemen next to each other. Uh, my, my name is George Gellman from Campos. Um, there's a double question. Um, uh, what is the explanation of the authors for the relative lack of civil society voice demanding these sorts of benefits in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I agree that a citizen voice is very important both in, in order to obtain those benefits, especially categorical ones, and then to make sure that they are delivered. The second part of the question is, what is actually the role of uh, overseas development systems in helping to bring about um, institute um, categorical benefits like social pensions and child allowances. Given that um, the ILO has done extensive studies on the cost of, uh, of introducing them in, in a number of African countries. Uh, Teddy Coleman, former MP, currently UEA doing masters. Um, as a politician, I'm interested, obviously, if the uh, research very much backs up the need to have political will uh, from the government's concerned. I, I think that the research looked at the situation in Lesotho and in Swaziland, uh, where the politicians <coughs> did actually commit to pensions. Was there any read across to the other southern African development community countries like Botswana or South Africa or Namibia in terms of setting, if you like, a standard which in a sense Swaziland and Lesotho were signing up to? or was it done without any sort of reference to a SADAC approach? And are there any lessons to learn from this in terms of uh, what advocacy NGOs and advocacy ex-politicians could actually press? Okay, anyone else at the far end of the room? Yeah, yeah Ellis Jones. In, 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 in Malawi, it had a sort of originally a sort of really targeted input farm input supply system which then was expanded greatly, initially with great donor resistance to it. I just wonder, in, in the work you've done in, in, in Malawi, how you've seen this farm input supply scheme, which was very broadly targeted at small farmers, actually having an impact on the poverty and food security. That's a good one. Um, thank you. Okay. Are you all right if we go to you first, Frank? I wonder if Phil would like to do with the demand. Um, the first demand point. Um, the uh, lack of civil society voice, that one. Or examples of people demanding mm. benefits. Um, I think our experience in <coughs> Southern Africa is that the, the level of civil society voice 
uh, is actually highly variable. Um, it's quite high in Zambia, uh, was in Zimbabwe, uh, much less so in other countries. Um, on the whole, I don't think it's fed into uh, a demand for social protection nearly as much as it should have done. Um, but this, I think, ties into one or two of the other points on political will, that uh, one of the ways um, it can feed in is through political pressure. And the fact that these countries have gone through a process of partial democratization makes that uh, an issue and was, in fact, um, a big issue behind Lesotho um, opting against international advice for um, a universal pension. Um, in fact, it was uh, announced by not the Ministry of Social Services, but the, uh, the finance minister shortly before an election. And then the following election, uh, that was in 2004, and the following election, uh, the opposition said, we're going to raise the pension amount to, what was it, 300 uh, maluti uh, from 150. So the government was pushed into raising uh, the amount to compete with that. And many people afterwards said that that was one reason why they voted for the government in the election. So that is this, this positive politicization of, of the process. Um, I suppose another aspect is the media, which are now only just now beginning to grapple with social protection as an issue. Um, and that's uh, in RHVP, for example, we are uh, hosting or... or um, featuring in a number of radio programs uh, around the region, and they seem to be quite successful. But on the whole, I think very little voice uh, <coughs> up to now. And I think the second part of that question was to do with uh, the role of, of um, donors as mm. sort of catalysts or funders of, of the different types of social protection that um, have been going on, and there there's a very diverse picture, actually. Uh, something like the pension schemes in, in Lesotho or Swaziland are wholly funded by the governments, and as Phil just said, in Lesotho's case, that was against the donors' ad advice. Um, in Zambia and Malawi and a lot of other countries, donors have been tending to, be, to fund quite small pilot schemes and those have been freestanding and in many ways sort of slightly cut off from government, even though ostensibly occurring under government umbrella, with a tremendous amount of technical input by, by external advisors. Um, in the case of the, the, these bigger schemes that we've been talking about outside Southern Africa, the Ghana LEAP scheme, the Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty, is wholly funded by the Ghana government, utilizing um, uh, resources released from um, HIPIC debt relief. So they're using debt relief money to, to fund that. <coughs> In the case of um, the Ethiopia PNSP, that's tremendously <coughs> dependent on donor funding. I'm not quite sure how much the Ethiopian government um, put into that. In the case of the Kenya um, Hunger Safety Net Program, which is just in the northern districts of Kenya, that is pretty well wholly funded by DFID over a 10-year period, with almost everything being done outside the Kenya government in order to avoid all sorts of problems that are perceived that could occur if the government were involved. So. That's another case altogether. So there is a wide variety of experience there. But definitely in terms of long-term sort of commitment and sustainability, it's when governments get right behind something and have the resources to see them through that I think real progress is made. But there was no SADAC read across. Oh, when we come to the SADAC read across. It's difficult to tell. You see, Botswana and Namibia already have pension schemes, as, of course, does South Africa. So it's perhaps not accidental that then Lesotho and then Swaziland also adopted pension schemes as their sort of first foray into scaled-up legislated social protection. So I think there probably is within that kind of quite tightly knit group of countries, but that doesn't spread out to the rest of SADC. So, and there's no, and there's no strong SADEC statement or, 
or force trying to sort of push that outwards from that sort of core group of countries? There are discussions going on in Malawi, <coughs> to a certain extent in Zambia, uh, and to a certain extent in Tanzania uh, about uh, pension schemes. But they're nowhere near the, the, the scaling up stage as yet. Now then there was the very interesting question, which I've probably forgotten most of the tenor of it, but it was about input subsidies in Malawi. And I think, there's a, I think this is an incredibly interesting issue for a country like Malawi, because Malawi does, as you say, now have a comprehensive um, uh, fertiliser subsidy scheme. And um, it, it's very interesting because the donors were appalled when this was adopted, but it was adopted for very strong political reasons at the time. And for two years, uh, production shot up and there was this tremendously strong effect of much lower food prices throughout the year, not just in the harvest season, but right through across the peak season as well as a consequence of the additional maize supplies being there. Then in the last sort of full year, and it's still a continuing program, something very odd happened because Malawi suddenly reverted to the price of maize more than doubling in the lean season compared to the, to the harvest season, even though, according to government figures, production had even gone up by another... Um, you know, amount due to the fertilizer subsidy. And so there's some, some really sort of deep hidden problem in there which have some partial explanations attached to it to do with exports that are not really properly recorded and things like that. But, but, but there's something unsatisfactory going on there. Now the other side of it which I think is interesting is Fertiliser subsidies are very, very expensive on the government exchequer, and I think there's a very interesting thing yet to be examined in Malawi about the relative opportunity cost between providing fertiliser subsidies on the one hand and providing much enhanced, scaled up social transfers on the other, and this has not really been examined. So the fertiliser subsidies at the moment are where Malawi is politically, but there are key issues there, I think, about, about relative effects on hunger and vulnerability of fertilised subsidies versus other, other means of supporting very poor people. Thank you. Anna, do you want to add anything? No. Okay. Into the middle of the room. Hands shoot oh, up. Wow. If we start with <laughs> Dennis, Angela, and the gentleman at the front, and then we'll come to the two ladies at the back. Um, Dennis Payne from DSID Social Protection Team. If I were a politician in Africa, um, and perhaps as a donor to here, I want to know, having introduced something, perhaps for political reasons, or because there is a crisis on, I want to know, how could I best get out of this and scale it down? What mechanism uh, would best enable me to scale it down? Uh, the Malawi government is caught on an escalating game, and you given the illustration on the social pensions, um, that's the nature of politics. So I would want to be pre-warned as the one that might enable me to scale down. Scaling up is easy compared to scaling down. <laughs> right. <laughs> How to rat on your obligations. You know? <laughs> 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 this is what you want to know. This is the guy with the I'm from from the Grow Up Free From Poverty Coalition, which is a number of um, UK-based international NGOs that have been working on social protection like you for two to three or four years. And thanks so much for publishing this timely book. Um, we look forward to reading it. And I'd just like to say what a great partner RHVP is as well. However, I'd, I'd like to sort of go back to the one or two uh, comments people have made about the political process, which seems to become the topic and ask you what you think, because you haven't mentioned the fact that last week, heads of government in Africa did commit themselves to introducing comprehensive social protection packages, and that they would debate what their minimum package was within the next two years. Because last October, 
in Namibia and was a very thorough consultative process involving civil society to a very high degree, there was a determination to go for national programs. It was inspired by people like the government of Ghana that came to describe what could be done, and indeed the government of South Africa, South Africa which described what could be done with relatively small amounts, as you've all said. So we now have a piece of paper signed up to by heads of government. And going back to the question on the categorical and those issues, it actually talks about the consensus on the minimum package. In other words, at national level, there should be a, a debate on what is affordable, what's the priority, which category of indeed should have the priority, and as you say, it often comes down to pension and hopefully some sort of child support grant or a grant for those who are stable. But given Savannah concluded that there are still all these debates, how can we come together to help governments in this financial constrained time to meet the obligations that they have just made? And if I could just add that thanks to this support to this process, there is a, a really burgeoning civil society movement that has formed a platform. Civil society from 23 African countries came together in Nairobi in September, formed a platform to, to, to build a consensus because one of the problems, and you had it in your huge slide, slide with all the different categories, is that everybody is competing for their little bit and governments are getting totally confused message. You know, is it children, old people, women, the disabled, all of everybody's households? And there has got to be a national debate from the bottom up to determine what is our national priority and what can we afford within the national resources, just as you say, Ghana has done. So I'd like to, to ask whether you can see this minimum package becoming the centre of the debate and how over the next two years we can support countries and civil society in those countries to reach conclusions about what their comprehensive system should look like. Uh, Ian Bust, ex Diffid, now with Plan International UK. Uh, I, I share many of Anna's uh, questions about the budgetary and the economic aspects of continuous legislated entitlement-based uh, protection. Uh, and I think we must add to those, of course, the question of exchange rates. I don't suppose many people in Zimbabwe would want anything which is denominated in Zimbabwe dollars. Uh, but my question goes a little bit to a different point. If you have continuous uh, legislated basic rights established, uh, then I would like to know whether the team uh, are going to go in a further, in a further volume or part of the project into, into the question of the impact of the rate of population growth. And if 11 to 12 percent of Ethiopia's present population uh, are in the needy category of being covered by, by the requirements which you mentioned, what is that figure going to be like in 10 years' time? and apply it to other countries, and then consider whether the whole thing is sustainable from that point of view, as well as the practicalities and the other aspects which we've been covering today. Thanks, Ian. I think population growth is quite often the elephant in the room that none of us are very willing to talk about at the moment. So I'm going to push you very hard to all respond is. to that. Anna's prepared I mean, just, just a quick comment on that. I mean, I think modelling future demographic scenarios is absolutely critical when you're developing a social protection package because of the kind of recurrent liabilities, the ongoing commitments that a, that a government is taking on. And I mean, particularly in South Africa, where they have the most generous social protection package and the most comprehensive social protection package in, in, in Africa, I mean, there, there's a continual process of, of modeling. And before any changes are made to the social protection coverage or to the, to the value of transfers, various demographic graphic scenarios are considered. But the big difficulty, I mean, the other elephant in the room, is that there's, there's very little agreed understanding of the impact of HIV AIDS on population sizes. I mean, in fact, we, we, we tend to assume that there is some kind of agreed wisdom in terms of the impact on population. But in fact, we had a very interesting study a few years ago um, at the University of Cape Town, where I used to work. And uh, five different people were commissioned to do a demographic model of the likely implications of HIV on population size. And they came up with five completely different outcomes, depending on the assumptions which were underlying their, their modeling. So actually, there's a whole range of demographic difficulties. There's, there's um, fertility rates, 
they have to pay HIV. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a wide number of things which have to be considered. And you're right, I mean, that's absolutely critical, because if you're making a commitment to recurrent costs, then you have to have some idea of what the future implications are going to be. So I think it's, it's a thorny issue, but it's a critical one. Do you want to say anything about the other two questions, about how you scale back or about how we help governments meet the obligations they've just made? Yes, what, one, one quick point on, on how one might scale back. I mean, it depends why one would want to scale back. And I think if, in the context of the financial crisis, clearly there's going to be a need for extended social protection interventions, which, as one hopes, the, the implications of the crisis recede over the next five, five ten years, um, programs can then scale down. And certainly what you've seen outside sub-Saharan Africa, but for example in Argentina, after the, the financial crisis there, was a program where at the height of the crisis people could enroll, but then after a certain period no more people could enroll. They could only exit the program. So I mean there are initiatives which have been developed to take account of that. But I suppose our question would have to be why would one want to reduce? Because if one is actually making a commitment to meet the needs of a certain segment of the population, perhaps some of those commitments one would expect to be ongoing. Thank you. Frank or Phil? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, uh, I mean, going back to that last point, um, the International Social Security Association, which uh, has been going since 1927, actually started with a pledge that uh, it should help around the world, including in developing countries, uh, the establishment of a social security system, uh, a permanent social security system such as we have in richer countries. And uh, they still uh, are plugging away at that, although that objective has tended to recede uh, over the intervening decades. But I think many people would see these kinds of social protection initiatives as a stepping stone to that, not something that can be wound up and then quickly wound, wound down again. Um, Angela, yeah, you, you were very right to point out there's been uh, some very recent uh, moves um, in uh, intergovernmental moves on social protection recently, as you said last week. Uh, this book was produced pretty quickly, but not quite that quickly, but, um, and last October in Windhoek. Um, what we're doing um, in the the phase two of our HVP um, is to put more emphasis on working with the SADAC's parliamentary forum on the one hand, but also with the, uh, the civil society platforms. And uh, in fact, um, we're doing a number of training programs with you guys uh, across Africa in the next uh, few months. Yes, very important point, and um, I should have mentioned that before. I think, just if I could just add to that, is that the politics within individual countries around these issues varies tremendously. So you can go to countries where just whatever's been said at some international forum, social protection is barely on the radar. I mean, mm. Phil and I were in Tanzania um, just before Christmas, and, it, and in Tanzania, social protection is minuscule. It's just you know two or three tiny little projects in a massive country um, which, which hasn't, you know, where real sort of discussion of this has hardly begun to occur at all. And I think that's probably the same in many other places. And, I mean, the Kenya example with this huge DFID-funded HNSP sort of avoiding the Kenya government for various reasons, <coughs> you know, is another illustration of the fact that, that domestic politics in individual countries is very important in, in this issue as well. Okay, so we're two final questions, I think. Are they still relevant? Can we send the microphone down to the back there, please? Yeah, we're better. Right. Oh, it's a close. I want to mention people are going. Um, it's Megan Rooney from AlertNet. Um, I just wanted to also extend the book to take into account the food strike um, spike um, in the first half of last year. Um, obviously, um, prices are coming down, although not so quickly in developing countries, but most um, experts on this say that we can expect a lot more volatility um, in food prices going forward, and you pointed to that as one weakness is cash transfers. And I noticed WFP is trialling a food voucher scheme um, at the moment. What, what conclusions um, can you make about, about that? Hi, I'm Tori Jones from Christine. Um, coming at this from a risk reduction perspective, um, 
and all where they might be giving uh, opinions on the scope of risk reduction. Mm -hmm. um, but seeing it as fundamentally about reducing vulnerability and equally applicable to chronic situations as to sudden impact or shock, um, and social protection being a key component within that. Just be interested to know whether in either in the studies, the cases that you studied, um, or in the book as a whole, whether you analyse the support from a risk reduction perspective, whether it is seen as falling within that framework within the country. And give your practical level, so for example, is there any oversight um, by national platforms for uh, disaster risk reduction or interaction between the two, or is it all seen very separately? Okay, I'm going to ask for really quick responses to those questions, and then, Felicity, just to prime you, I'm going to give you the last word to tell people about the special offer on the book today. Okay. Good. I was rather worried we might lose some sales there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the food price volatility. Well, um, food price volatility for sure has been there all the time. It's... Um, it's not something just related to the recent international uh, food price hike, which received a, gr a huge amount of attention, obviously, when it occurred and is now receding. Um, a, a great number of sub-Saharan African countries, their internal food markets are actually fairly insulated from the world market for very obvious reasons. I mean, reasons of distance from markets, transport costs, quality differences, and so on. So you will find within individual countries that seasonal price changes in, in the main staple grains are often absolutely huge. They're, you know, they're dramatically more unstable than the equivalent prices in the international market. And that's been the case going back a long way. And I think that this does represent a difficulty for, for cash transfers and, and, a, and a sort of rather glib uh, I think it's slightly glib, solution is, well, what mixture of food and cash can be put together in order to overcome this problem so that you would give food when prices were high and you would give cash when prices were sort of stable or low. It's glib in the sense that that is actually logistically incredibly difficult to do at scale. It's something you might be able to do on a on a tiny pilot program, but actually to consider doing it for a whole country to sort of phase in and out cash and food, I think, is, 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 is very difficult. So the final part of your question is, how are you going to solve this? And the answer is, I think we need to think about it quite a lot more before we can do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, shall I just tackle the last question? Sure. And, um, I think risk reduction uh, did inform the design of this program. And in fact, uh, I was working on uh, DFID's disaster risk reduction scoping study just before working on this program. And we brought a lot of those ideas in. I think we, we would see um, social protection as a risk reduction, uh, a component of risk reduction, but one that doesn't necessarily uh, or even mostly focus on um, covariant risks, in other words, disasters, um, but more on uh, individual risks and individual vulnerability. So the whole disaster, uh, disaster risk reduction um, ideas have gone into this, for, for sure, but not just focusing on, on disasters. No. I mean, that doesn't answer your question, perhaps. Um, it, it, I mean, it's funny how these things have labels. Disaster risk reduction has a label which, which denotes a certain sort of special concept. But in fact, many of those same concepts uh, have come into this. I think, I think that, I mean, there are various concepts, but mm. the one that we take it from is very much marrying self-protection, um, mm. which you can mm. an individual or a community and social protection which you can't. And so from our perspective, social protection is a very key, very key component. But it's more on sort of pra practical, whether at a, a national level, there is any um, overlap or coordination of this. 
thank you. Sorry, I'm going to ask you two to carry on with this one bilaterally with anybody else who wants to join in. And since today was about the launch of the book, I'm going to give the last word to Felicity. Thanks, everybody. Um, hello, yes, I'm Felicity from Edward Elgar Publishing, and we're obviously very pleased to be publishing the book. And I um, have lots of copies here if you'd like to buy a copy. Um, we have a half price discount just for today, so it's only £12.50 for the case back. So if you'd like to buy a copy, then come see me. Okay. Now I'll be around for the next half an hour or so. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody.